Greetings to you. Bishop Vetter here, your bishop. Just a few things, you know, about baptism. Uh, first is the name. We ask, what name do you give your child? That's amazing, huh? What name did you give your child? And there's such a sacredness to that whole process. It's a wonderful thing, you know, even as parents, if you've never done this, visit with your children about how you came up with their name, how you chose it, all the different other names you thought of as possibilities, and how you chose the name for each one of your children. Because they're going to be known by that name for eternity. You are taking part in the process of God naming your child. That they will have that name for eternity. Their names will be written in the book of heaven, right? The book of eternal life. Uh, what a beautiful thing. And the power of a name. When God reveals his name to Moses, what power he's given us. God, by giving us his name, to call on him, to say bad things about him, to use his name in vain. So there's real power that comes. Also, when you give your child a name, what power you give to speak well of them or ill of them? The beauty of a person's name, to have a deeper reverence and respect for a person's good name. Everyone has a right huh, to a good name and to a good name. So choose well as you choose those names uh, for your children for eternity. Uh, after the naming, uh, then we have the profession of faith, the oldest one, given us by the apostles, the Apostles' Creed. And it's a question and answer. First I ask what you don't believe in. So we start by saying, do you reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? We say, yes, we reject Satan, right? So first we say what we don't believe in. We don't believe in Satan. Then, okay, then what do you believe in? I believe in one God, the Father, and in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and the church and the communion of saints. A powerful thing. Then we bless water. That ancient rite of blessing water recalls all the times that God has used water. Right? Water over the earth before creation, when he created heaven and earth, uh, when he uh, used the great flood of Noah to wash away evil. All right? when, he, uh, when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, all these different times throughout history that God has used water. And now he's going to use water again to save and set us free. Billions and billions and billions of people have been saved through water right? and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then we have the baptism itself. Very simple. Pour water and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And amazing things happen. Original sin is washed away. The effects remain. We'll get to that another time, concupiscence. But original sin is washed away. And every personal sin, if it's an adult, every personal sin until that moment. Uh, the uh, Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. The Trinity. Imagine that. The whole Trinity comes and lives in us. Changes our souls forever. Leaves a mark. An indelible mark, we call it. Can never be repeated. Can never be unbaptized. Right? It's done for eternity. We're adopted as God's children, as his child. And because we're part of his family, we get part of the inheritance, which is eternal life. Right? Which is incredible. We're made a member of the church. Not only our parish church, not only this church here on earth, but the church in heaven and the church in purgatory. That we're made a member right, of that church, uh, of the body of Christ, um, forever that we're a part of it. And then... Uh, Adopted as God's child. I mean, that's just amazing. If we can let that sink in. Then we're anointed with sacred chrism. Sacred chrism is an oil that gets its name from Christ itself, which means the anointed one. It's just perfumed with balsam, one of the oldest perfumes, really. It's an ancient perfume. Christ himself was anointed right, with oil. And so it's a sealing of that sacrament, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then just some basic things we do right away. We give a white garment that they're clothed with Christ. Actually, in the early church, when adults were clothed in it, it's where we get the white alb, the white garment underneath the priest's vestments. That's the baptismal garment. We put it on again for girls for their First Holy Communion, that little white dress, and then brides put it on, believe it or not. That's what that white garment is. Their, 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 their dress, their bridal dress, is their white garment from baptism. That's what the symbol is. We put it back on as we celebrate another sacrament. Then we all get it again when we die. The white cloth is put over the coffin. 
right? To remind us that we're clothed with Christ and death has no power over us. And so that white garment is given us uh, because we've been clothed with Christ. Uh, and in the early church, adults work for a whole month. So people would say, oh, look, it, there's a new Christian. It was a public thing, not a private thing, right? That we wear our faith, that it, it's everywhere, inside and out. And it's shown by this garment. And then the baptismal candle, you're given a candle, lit, lit from the Easter candle, right? From, that we light on Holy Saturday as a symbol of Christ, who's the light of the world, uh, which is powerful. My first funeral I ever had, it was a 76-year-old man. He had his little baptismal candle on the altar. We burned the last of it for his funeral. But he would use it when things got tough, when, when things were difficult in his family, when he was worried, when he was scared, when his kids didn't come home, uh, when his wife died. He'd turn all the lights off in his house, light his Easter candle, his baptismal candle, and remind himself that Jesus is the light of the world. And this darkness will not overcome, that it'll pass. So use your baptismal candles. We have them in a drawer somewhere. Don't save them. Get them out. In fact, a little trivia for you, so you can impress your friends at the next cocktail party. In fact, you know, the little candles in our birthday cakes, that comes from our baptismal candles. Baptism and birth used to be very close because of the mortality rate for children. When they would die so close to death, so many of them, they'd baptize right away. And so what moms would do, being brilliant, huh, like Mother Church, put little candles in their cake to count how many years it's been since they've been saved. So don't use the number. Put those candles in to count those years that we've been saved through baptism. That's a wonderful tradition. And then, right, we bless parents at the end. We have godparents, which start in the beginning. Parents on behalf of God. That's no small thing. And the parents and godparents have been blessed at the end of the baptism. And off you go, right? Off you go uh, to live as a new creation, chosen by Jesus to become his brother and sister, true children of God. And then we do the same. Go therefore, teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.